amazing You're all powerful I'm in awe Of your glory Lord, you're amazing Yeah You are wonderful I'm in awe Of your glory Every single day I think about you Because in life there is no hope without you I don't know where I'd be If you weren't here with me You stretched out the heavens Yeah, you numbered the stars You gave me my purpose So now my life is yours you are amazing You are marvelous I stand in complete awe Of your righteousness Lord, you are amazing You're my daily bread I stand in complete awe Cause you're clearly the best you're amazing You're all powerful I'm in awe Of your glory Lord, you're amazing You are wonderful I'm in awe Of your glory you should care about me You gave your life just so that I could be free I don't know what I'd do If your word wasn't true You gave me direction You taught me your will You've proven your love for me So now I am fulfilled For you are If there is one thing I've learned It's that your love for me is the greatest thing I've known The most fulfilling thing is to bow before your throne Jesus, I love you I need you more than anything When my heart was full of sorrow and pain You took it all away When all of my sin Was too much to bear You washed it all away Yeah Since you gave your life 
Just so I could be free To seek and follow you Is the only thing I want to do Cause you're my sustainer My healer My savior Redeemer by your stripes I'm healed, by your love I'm fulfilled Thank you Lord for loving me If there is one thing I've learned It's that your love for me is the greatest thing I've known The most fulfilling thing is to bow before your throne Jesus I love you, I need you more than anything Despite my mistakes, despite all my faults, you chose to call on me. You chose to call on me. You gave me a chance, and you taught me how to change. So I will give you all of me. Yeah, since you gave your life. Just so I could be free To seek and follow you Is the only thing I want to do Cause you're my sustainer My healer My savior Redeemer By your stripes I'm healed By your love I'm fulfilled Thank you Lord for loving me If there is one thing I've learned is that your love for me is the greatest thing I've known The most fulfilling thing is to bow before your throne yeah, yeah. Jesus, I love you, I need you more than anything I'll give my life to you every single day no matter what the people around me say To live my life for you, most fulfilling thing I love you, I need you more than anything I give my life to you every single day No matter what the people around me say To live my life for you, most fulfilling thing I love you, I need you more than anything I will give my life to you every single day no matter what the people around me say To live my life for you, most fulfilling thing I love you, I need you more than anything I'll give my life to you every single day No matter what the people around me say To live my life for you, most fulfilling thing I love you, I need you If there is one thing I've learned Is that your love for me is the greatest thing Fulfilling thing is to bow before your throne Jesus, Jesus I love you, I need you, I need you more than anything No matter how hard I try, I cannot ignore all the pain that the world feels every day Even in my own life There are things I can't overcome Without the light to shine away And so I'm grateful for the way you came and rescued me Despite the things I did, you chose to set me free if not for you, my life would cease to mean nothing. Therefore, I follow you wholeheartedly. Just show me the way. Show me the way to reciprocate your love. The love that saved my soul. Give me the strength to live according to your word. Cause I can't do it alone I need your mercy I need your grace I need your favor And I could always use more faith Show me the way
show me the way Show me the way to This appropriation love The love that's in my soul Give me the strength to Live according to your word Cause I can't do it alone I need your mercy Mistakes and can't control circumstance. I put too much trust in myself and my plans. I'm such a prideful man. Oftentimes I run away from the suffering and trials of life. Yet I know it's too fire that our hearts are purified. I try to avoid it as if you were. Such a weak will man. I'm so sick and tired of not doing your will. It's only your love that can fulfill. There's nothing to gain, and there's no broken chains unless you're leading the way. Yeah, yeah. In other words, God, I am. Bibles to Isaiah chapter 65. My name is Ken Chin and this lovely lady next to me is my amazing and talented wife Cheryl. 
We bring you greetings from the North Ministry. What is being built into the North region and one day the Maryland Church. We miss seeing you guys and being a part of the sweet fellowship that comes from meeting together in person. But soon and very soon, I believe, we will meet it together face to face. But for now, we're grateful for the virtual realm and our cyber team that brings us together, so to speak, and allows us to worship our almighty God as family. In Isaiah 65, in verse 17, it says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and his people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. This morning, how are you feeling, family? Are you feeling inspired to do something great for God? You know, God is doing something great for us. He is creating a new beginning for the church here in D.C. with the coming of Ron and Tracy Harding and the supplemental mission team. With the unveiling of Operation Freedom for the DMV, we are glad and our hearts are filled with joy to have not just a dream, but a plan to win our communities for the Lord. At the church, we just participated in the African Missions Conference entitled Rise Up. And it was incredible. We joined our sister churches in Lagos, Nigeria, Johannesburg, South Africa, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo, Abidjan, Bujumbura, Yaoundé, and Brazzaville, to name a few. We heard lessons and classes on topics like rising out of the ashes, the time to rise is now, and rise up. At this time, Cheryl will share a few thoughts. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the new beginnings of a new and exciting time. We are coming off an amazing Africans Missions Conference, like my husband just said, mm -hmm. as well as a fun family time on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Now, on Wednesday, we met as a church and introduced all of the smaller family groups that we call Bible Talks in the church. Now, I might not have immediately seen the connection between a conference entitled Rise Up and what the church is presently going through but sitting captivated over the three days of a heart-stirring set of lessons, I saw it. I saw that the purpose of rising up is to give us a new beginning. What impacted me from each and every one of the powerful messages and charges that we heard over the last weekend was one recurrent theme. We can rise up to start again. We can rise up to shake off whatever hindered us before. We can rise up and remember that as long as God is in control, there will always be good news to share. Every day, this day, today, right now, is the time to make the decision to rise up. Come on. We rise up in order to plant new churches. We rise up and denounce the lies of materialism in order to sacrifice for our mission teams to plant those churches. Our sacrifices allow campus students to also rise up and dream. And I have to say that it is such a treat to hear and see the excitement of these idealistic young people ready to take on the oh. world for Jesus. I think, Honestly, though, the charge that stood out to me the most in my role as a shepherd here in the church is that I can rise up from past hurts and disappointments to meet the challenging shepherding needs in the church. In fact, I have to do so. But I believe, ladies, that we need to rise up in support of the men who lead us, our co-leaders, our husbands. It was incredibly convicting and reassuring to see our evangelist and women's ministry leader, Ron and Har Tracy Harding, playing a vital role in the Africans Missions Conference and being totally one in mind and heart with our world sector leaders, Dr. Andrew and Patrick Smelly. Because I believe we do need to rise up together in order to build each other up mm -hmm. and build together. I saw that we are all family, even in places and countries in Africa where I could not pronounce the names. I feel like God is offering us, whether we're in this church or outside this church, a new start. So please feel welcome if you could do with a new beginning in your life. 
And with that, we'd like to welcome you to the Washington, D.C. International Christian Church. And at this time, I want to ask my brother, Ronell Dorville, to pray. Hey, family, good morning. Uh, my name is Ronell Dorville. This is my lovely wife, Danielle Dorville. Uh, we lead the West House Church. And uh, uh, let's go ahead and, and go before the Lord uh, this morning in prayer. Uh, Father God, I just want to thank you so much for today, God. I'm just, just so grateful for just the opportunity to worship you this morning, God. I pray, God, that the uh, worship is acceptable to you, God, that we come before you uh, with, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, God. Father, uh, Lord, I just pray for your kingdom, God. Just so grateful to be a part of a, a worldwide movement, God, of brothers and sisters who are worshiping you this morning in spirit and in truth. Please be with every aspect of the worship service today, God, uh, from the singing, the communion, and the contribution, God, as well as the lesson, Father God. I pray that you give uh, Ron a double portion of your Holy Spirit, God, to preach and to teach, God, to our hearts, God, uh, that we can leave uh, this worship service different men and women than we entered into it, God. Uh, Father, I just pray and just want to lift up in prayer um, all of our, our missionaries, Father God, uh, abroad as well as locally, Father God, those that are uh, that have moved here from uh, California and Atlanta and Florida, Father God, Indianapolis, Father God. I pray that as they come to uh, to gather with the with the body of believers here, God, that they feel welcome, that they feel love, Father God, and uh, Lord, just that we're just so encouraged. Uh, to have them here and being with us, God. Lord, please forgive us of our sins, God. Uh, Lord, that uh, we all are equal before you at the foot of the cross, Father. I pray that, Lord, as we, uh, as we consider our sin uh, this week, uh, this day, even this hour, Father God, uh, mm -hmm. that we come to you with humility, uh, that we come to you with gratitude, God, and that your, your mercy, God, motivates us to repent, Father. Lord, we love you so very much, God. Let the singing uh, be joyful and uh, shake the heavens, Father God, as we as we rejoice with the angels. We love you so much, Father. We thank you for this day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Nelson Brown. I'm Sydney Brown. We are from the Phoenix International Christian Church. I'm super grateful to be here, and we are very excited to be with you all in the DC Church. Hey, family, I'm Miles Swartz. I'm from the Atlanta International Christian Church. I'm very excited to be here and super grateful to be part of the DC Church. Love y'all. Hey family, my name is Sandra Smith and I'm from the AMS region of the Los Angeles International Christian Church. I'm very grateful to be here and I'm super excited to be with you all in the DC Church. Hey family, this is Dara Teamer from the Atlanta International Christian Church and I'm so grateful to be here with you guys in the DC International Christian Church. Hey family, my name is Marvin Alcantara. I am from the Tampa Bay International Christian Church and I'm super grateful and I'm super excited to be here as part of the DC International Christian Church. Love you. Hey family, I'm Donnie Boone from the Atlanta International Christian Church. I'm super grateful to be here and I'm excited to be a part of the DC Church. I love you. Hi family, my name is Tish Cheney and I am from the Atlanta International Christian Church. I'm so excited and so grateful to be with you all here in DC. Hey fam, we are the Cayennes. I'm Dima and this is Lily. Uh, we're from the Indianapolis International Christian Church. We are so grateful, so honored and so excited to be here, part of the Washington DC Church. Hi, my name is Jay. And I'm Tanya. And we're and the, the Rianos. Rianos. We're from the central region of the Tampa Bay International Christian Church and we're so, so excited and grateful to be here with the DC Church. Hi family, my name is Cliff Lerich and I am from the Atlanta International Christian Church. I am super grateful to be here and I'm very excited to be with you all in the DC Church. Hello my beautiful family, my name is Dennis Toledo and I'm originally from the south region of the Metro Miami International Christian Church. Um, I'm so grateful to be a part of this family here in DC and I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. Hey family, my name is Nishi Patel, I'm from the south region of the Metro Miami International Christian Church and I'm very grateful to be here. I'm super excited to be here with all of you in the DC Church. Hey family, we're Damon and Vicki James of the Atlanta International Christian Church. 
We're super grateful to be here and we're excited to be with you guys in the DC Church. Hey family, I'm Joshua Galindo and I'm from the Atlanta International Christian Church. I'm super grateful to be here and I'm very excited to be with you all in the DC Church. Hey family, my name is Kiana Dudley, but everyone calls me Kiki, and I have the privilege to serve in the singles ministry here at the Houston International Christian Church. I am beyond grateful to be here and even more excited to be with you all in D.C. <laughs> To, uh, just to see God move in his heart, his humility, and uh, his, his hunger uh, to be a student of God's word. And one thing that really stood out was his humility. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone much older to listen to someone much younger mm -hmm. and to actually believe that there was something else. And I know I haven't always had that humility to be willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And just to see where you were, mm -hmm. where you've learned so much, but yet you were still willing to learn more. Yeah. Wow. And that was really encouraging, inspiring to us all. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of, you know, in John 3, Nicodemus, and just right. having That's that right. humble heart to say, okay, if I got to start over, I'll start over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's... That takes a lot, and it, it's really inspiring. Yeah. So we're excited, we're fired up to be here. Yeah. 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 Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? He came to the earth, lived a sinless life, was crucified, and died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, but rose on the third day by the power of God. Do you believe that? I believe that. But he arose and he is sitting on the right hand of God. Amen. 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 That's what I believe. Amen. So what is your good confession, Uncle Taylor? That Jesus is my Lord. Woo! Woo! Because of your good confession, I can now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be added to the kingdom of God, the family of God. Amen. 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 Right, let's do it forward. Okay, you gotta get it all the way on. Okay, right. hold on. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Let's go. 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 Let's Announcements. On June 20th, we'll be having a Father's Day picnic at 11 a.m. That picnic is going to be at Valley Mill Park at 1600 East Randolph Road in Silver Spring, Maryland, 20904. The following week, on June 27th, we'll be back in virtual services right here on Facebook and on YouTube at 11 a.m. Then the following week, is our big kickoff Bring Your Neighbor Day on July 4th at 11 a.m. It'll be an in-person park service, and we have the theme of Let My People Go. 
It's a focus on all those who have walked away from the church trying to influence them to come back. And we will again be at Valley Mill Park. The following Sunday on July 11th, we'll be back in a virtual service on Facebook and YouTube. And then on July 18th, we'll be back at the park again at 11 a.m. On July 27th, we'll have another virtual service. Now, moving forward into August, we want to give you early notice. We'll be having between August 7th and 9th, our second annual Virtual World's Mission Jubilee. And then we'll have an historic event on September 2nd, on Memorial Day weekend, from September 2nd to 5th, we will have our very first annual Campus Leadership Seminar. We want to encourage every campus student in Washington, D.C. to reach out and sign up and register for this incredible event that's going to build up leadership for our campuses and for our future church plantings all over the world. I love you guys. Let's have an incredible service today. Greetings from the Cyber Ministry. In keeping with our theme scripture for cyber appointments, Exodus 35.10 reads, all who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. Today we are so excited that we have Marvin Alcantara, who has come to be appointed a cyber evangelist. You know, Marvin started out in Los Angeles serving in the central region, and he was under my charge in the crew super region, and then he went on a mission team to Tampa with the McGee's, and now he's come on the supplemental team right here to Washington, D.C. Uh, he's become such a reliable man and so skilled uh, in making so many things that the Lord commands in the kingdom. I'm very excited to appoint Marvin today. You know, as a gift for the cyber appointments, we have our globes that read Acts 17, 6. These are the people who have been turning the world upside down. And today, I am so honored and proud to be able to present this to Marvin Alcantara. I love you, bro. You're an incredible servant. Thank you so much for all that you do for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, I do just want to give a, just so many thanks out. Thank you uh, to Kyle Bartholomew who uh, put me on the cyber ministry. Uh, thank you for believing in me and pushing me. Uh, Mark Garrido for continuing to use me, for instilling in me the, the, the need to... Start over again and say, I wanna thank Mark Garrido, just start from there. I wanna thank Mark Garrido as well, because you believed in me, you pushed me, even when I didn't have the confidence to continue. Thank you to Bryce Williams for making a friend, for teaching me to be kind, and teaching me to be faithful with the work I've been given. Thank you to Mike Underhill for teaching me how to have deep convictions in my discipleship. Thank you to Jared McGee for taking me to Tampa, believing in me, raising me up, and teaching me to never give up. Thank you so much to my parents. Mom and dad, you guys are my heroes. And you've taught me so many amazing things. So many things that I, that I use today and I see that they all come from you. It's all character things that come from you. Hard work, dedication. And thank you finally to, to Ron Harding because you believed in me, you pushed me to be my, be my best, and you made all this happen. Thank you for bringing me on the mission team to, Wash to Washington. I'm super grateful to be here with you. I love you. Amen. Remember our mission statement for the cyber ministry is creating, maintaining, and preserving and propelling the kingdom of God. We love you. Keep frying the airwaves until every soul has heard. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Come on, us. let it rise. Someone say, oh, 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 oh. let it rise. Let the 
Good morning, family. My name is Marvin, and this is my awesome sister, Sandra, and we'll be presenting over communion this morning. Sandra's asked me to read a scripture in Colossians chapter 2. If you turn your Bibles with me, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, bro. Uh, good morning, family. Uh, it sounds cliche, but I feel like it's such an honor to be here with you. Um, I've been here now for a week and a half, and I can see more and more why God sent me to be with this incredible family in D.C. Um, a bit about me. Um, I'm mixed. My mom is from Mexico, and my dad is from Iowa. Um, I was raised in Iowa, and thanks be to God, I had a very loving family. Uh, my parents are incredible. I also have three wonderful sisters, and we spent so much time together, we never even had a curfew growing up. Uh, we went to church, and we had movie nights, we had bike rides, road trips, adventures. Um, you know, to the outside world, it looked like I had it all together. And even though at the age of 12, I made the decision to remain a virgin, and thanks be to God that I'm still on that path, there was still a lot of sin hidden deep inside of my heart. Um, after leaving home and departing for college, I felt a tiny pang of emptiness. And the reality is, it had always been there, this tiny hole in my heart. I had romanticized what life would look like as an adult. And to give you the short version, the hole in my heart just continued to grow. I had many of my dreams come true, but despite the external success, I felt internally empty. I had this hole in my heart that nothing seemed to fill. And the more my dreams came true, the more empty I began to feel. I think the only thing worse um, than not having your dreams come true is to have your dreams come true and still feel alone. I knew something was deeply wrong because the truth is I wasn't living the truth. I was playing church. I was going to church every Sunday. I was in the praise team. I was a greeter at church, um, I was head of the acting ministry, but I was also immersed in a very dark lifestyle. I had started partying with friends on the weekends and we started drinking pretty heavily and it catapulted into one night having an affair with a married man. And it didn't just end there. The affair went on for two years. And this entire time, I was still going to church. It didn't end until one day I remember looking in the mirror and hating myself and thinking, how did I get here? I started desperately crying out to God. It was the first time in my life that I surrendered. I said, I'm done, God. I've done life my way. It hasn't worked out, so now it's your turn. I spent the next two weeks praying and reading the Bible and just crying out to Jesus for my soul to be saved. Three months later, one of our sisters from AMS, Marisha Legan Johnson, she reached out to me and invited me to Bible talk and everything changed. On September 16th, 2018, I said yes to Jesus and I was forgiven for my sins. It was the first time I've ever had a real relationship with God. I'm elated to now have this opportunity to reciprocate, to show God how much I love him by saying yes to his call, saying yes to the full-time ministry and yes to being on his supplemental mission team. It's such an honor to be in this city and in this church, to be part of God's true mission for our planet. I told God the day I was baptized that I would give him everything, every single broken piece. And I won't pretend that I'm 100% there, because I'm not, 
But day by day and prayer by prayer, I'm giving and growing to be more like him and less like myself. I'm super grateful for our beautiful, perfect father. And I'm so excited to be on the most important mission. My heart is finally full. And I'm super excited to share with you that today the cross means to me completeness. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing so powerfully and vulnerably. As we reflect on the cross, let's pray over communion. Father God, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you so much, Father, for reaching down, Father, and, and rescuing us from our sin. Thank you so much for the sacrifice of your Son at the cross. Thank you so much for so many good things that you give us. But also, Father, thank you so much for allowing us to see that we needed you. Father, I pray that each of the hearts today can be moved, that each of the hearts today can be uh, connected with you, and that as we connect with you, we're reminded of the same mission, of the same calling that you give us, that you help us see just how much we need you. Thank you so much, Father, and I pray finally that we are all connected with you at, at a much deeper level today. We love you, Father, and we pray this on Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Communion is a time where the Bible says as one man, meaning one church, we all at one time take the bread that represents Jesus' body, we break a piece off, and then we eat that bread, remembering how our sin broke the body of Jesus. And then we take the juice, and as we drink the juice, we are remembering how the blood of Jesus has covered over all of our sins. And then we have a time of meditation where we go away understanding just how much the Lord has forgiven us. Good morning, church. My name is Miles Sports, and I lead the George Washington University Campus Ministry. And I am fired up to be here with you all today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21 as I share why I love to give back to God. Luke 21 verse 1 says, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And I think this passage is amazing. You know, right off the bat, it says Jesus is watching everyone as they give. And I think that's really an alarm to us when we are worshiping God. He is watching us. He wants to see how we worship in our singing, how we worship in our studies, right, from the Bible, also in our giving. He's watching all these people go and put their money in the plate. You know, and it says the, the rich were giving out of their wealth. And so it kind of appears to me like, you know, the rich people are walking up, got their big satch, uh, satchel of gold, and they're throwing it in the plate. And, you know, they're, they're like, okay, I gave my, my best to God today. But the poor widow, widow comes in and gets her two last copper coins. And it makes me think, you know, what was the difference between her and someone else who was just coming into the temple and maybe came empty-handed. Well, Jesus recognized her even more so than those who were giving tons of money to the church. Why? Because she had the heart to worship God with something. She didn't come empty-handed. And I think we can get in the habit of, you know, I've got to take care of this bill here, or, you know, I just moved here into D.C., and I've got a lot of, you know, financial changes now that I'm an intern and going to be leading this campus ministry, it can be real easy for me to be like, you know what, I'm not going to give this week because X, Y, and Z. But this passage here calls me higher and shows me that it's not about the amount that I'm giving, but it's really the heart. Do I, do I have the heart to give something? And I really want to call all of us to, to give something. You know, we, we're all giving virtually right now. You can't give 50 cents on PayPal, so give a dollar. You know, just put something in because it is part of our act of worship. And that's something that I've really grown in my own faith when it comes to this passage and my walk with God. So uh, I really uh, hope that this passage inspires you to not come empty-handed to God and to know that it is not about the amount, but it is the heart in which you give it. 
And so with that, I want to pray for our contribution. Father God, good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to share today, and thank you for this example here in the Bible to show us that you do not care about the amounts, God, but that you care first and foremost about our heart to give. Please allow everyone who hears this message to give today, Father. Please allow us to, to, to give with a happy and joyful heart, even if it's just uh, something small, God. Please allow us to give it as an act of worship, and I pray that you are pleased with it. Thank you so much for this service, and I pray that uh, we can continue to give to you every week, God, with grateful and sincere hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. God's gonna trouble the water Wait in the water Wait in the water, children Wait in the water God's gonna trouble the water Now you see those people dressed in red And Moses led. Now you see those people dressed in gold. They look like disciples of Christ, I'm told. Who you've got to wait. To trouble the water. Now I looked over yonder, and what did I see? I saw all God's angels coming from me. Now, if you don't believe that I've been redeemed. Then follow me down to the Jordan Street. Ooh, you've got to wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water like me, Shad, Shad, Ragin. Then go by faith into the fiery furnace. I go like David's to Goliath with just one shot. My faith in the Lord. Trouble the world.
or saw it before the sermon. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we're disciples by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we're disciples by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we're disciples by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we're disciples by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and crucify our pride. And they'll know we're disciples by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we're disciples by our love. And all praise to the Father from whom all blessings come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, His one and only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we're disciples by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we're disciples by our love. Phenomenal service we had so far. Please be turning in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1. You know, we got to hear Sandra's story today. We got to hear Miles' convictions on giving. We were able to see Marvin appointed a cyber evangelist in the kingdom of God. And we got to see Danielle's Uncle Taylor baptized right there into the Lord. I mean, what an incredible time so far. And then even after the lesson, we're going to hear... All the good news around the world with GNN, the Good News Network. Today we begin our journey together to build not only the D.C. church, but also all of the mid-Atlantic churches. And the concept I want us to talk about today is where the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And so with that, I'd like us to read 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1. Paul writes, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that God has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we need not say anything about it. You know, one of our goals as a church is that every person in the church has this kind of heart. And, you know, here's a story to help us out. Late one night, a burglar broke into a house, and he thought it was empty. He tiptoed in the living room, and suddenly he froze in his tracks when he heard a loud voice say, Jesus is watching you. Silence returned to the house, so the burglar kind of crept forward a little bit there, and, and, and then again, Jesus is watching you. And the voice boomed. So the, the, the burglar stopped dead again, and, and he was frightened, and frantically looking all around, and in a dark corner, he spotted a bird in a birdcage. That was a parrot. 
And he asked the parrot, he said, was, was that you who said Jesus is watching me? Yes, the parrot answered. The burger just sighed, sighed relief. Oh my gosh, thank the Lord, that's a parrot. He goes, what's your name? Clarence, said the bird. Well, that's a dumb name for a parrot, the burglar sneered. Well, what kind of idiot named you Clarence? And the parrot said, the same idiot that named the Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> you, know, you know, a church after God's own heart is full of members who remember their own personal righteousness because they know Jesus is watching. You know, since Jesus is watching you and I, as we go through these scriptures, I want you to ask yourself but just one question that I must ask myself consistently. If everyone imitates me, what kind of church is this going to be? That's the question. If everyone imitates me, what kind of church is this going to be? Let's get our Bibles open and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible reads, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. <laughs> for 40 days, it was all about the kingdom of God. You, you know, when Tracy and I left Atlanta, we left the last 40 days wrapping up everything that we had been teaching the Atlanta church over the last two and a half years since we planted the church. <laughs> you know, in my farewell lessons to the staff and, and to the church, I chose to teach on humility because the Atlanta church has seen great successes in the last two and a half years. And I knew that we all know that we need humility in these trials, but we also, when we find successes, must find a place of humility so we do not forget about the Lord. And if we're going to build a great church here after God's own heart, then we need to start with what was on the Lord's heart in his farewell speech. Let's turn to Matthew 28. I've got four things that describe a church after God's own heart. Number one, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mount where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and he said, well, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey what? Everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Isn't it reassuring to know that all authority was given to Jesus and the way he used that authority was to say, go and make more disciples that make more disciples. You know, right here's the motivating vision for what we do. He says, guys, here's the deal. I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations. Take those disciples that you make and baptize them. Then teach them to obey everything. You know, the Apostle Matthew records that Jesus told his disciples to start a chain reaction in making a disciple that baptizes a disciple, that teaches those disciples to obey everything he commanded. He set the world ablaze. You know, he, he didn't just baptize somebody who was hanging out or just kind of nod their head in agreement. You know that? We're sitting in the audience. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then goes off and keeps living the same way. Because Jesus didn't make bobbleheads. He made true disciples of Jesus that are sold out to the call of the Great Commission. And he flat told them to baptize real disciples that are set on allowing him to be Lord by obeying what he taught. Now what was the last thing he taught? Go make more disciples. And that means 
I got to ask every member of the Washington, D.C. church a question in regards to the Great Commission. If everyone imitates you, what kind of church is this going to be in obeying the Great Commission? Because certainly the Great Commission is our commission. I mean, how about it? Do you really want someone to help you be like Jesus? Do you really want a great discipling relationship right now? I mean, if the whole church were imitating you, what kind of church would that be right now? It would be an exciting church, or maybe it would be a scared church. Would people respectively, with honesty, say what they think and hear and, and talk through everything? Or would it be a dishonest church where feelings stay hidden and quiet reservations and, well, I was going to say, but I didn't. Would it be a fruitful church or a fearful church? Would it be a church of people changing the world or a church of busybodies? You say, well, you know, I'm visiting here. Well, what is a discipling relationship? And I, I'm, I'm glad some of you are thinking that. See, it's a relationship where one imperfect human being calls another imperfect human being towards a perfect lifestyle based on the perfect Word of God, even though they're not perfect. You see, it's a perfect plan that God had to have imperfect people who, since they're not perfect, can't really look down upon each other, help another imperfect person to obey as much of God's perfect truths as possible. Now, did you notice that Jesus didn't say, teach them to agree with everything? Didn't say, teach them to agree. He said, teach them to obey. You know, John 8, 31 is one of our key scriptures in our first principle studies, and it basically says, if you obey, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free from the behavior that keeps you in spiritual bondage. I mean, in a very serious way, Jesus told her, his disciples to be in each other's lives, identifying disobedience and calling each other to obedience to what Jesus taught. You, you know, Disciples, prayerfully, you want that person in your life, challenging you forthrightly, yet lovingly and, and gently, but ever so much by the word of God. In fact, we describe it as a constant, godly, gentle pressure for self-righteousness, personal righteousness. And then likewise, no, no matter what's happening, all sold-out disciples that, that are obeying Jesus never stop reaching out to this lost world, bringing new friends into a saving relationship with Christ. Let me tell you what, when you got a sold-out disciple, everything around them can be falling apart, and they're still helping people with the Word of God to be baptized and to mature in Christ and to go make more disciples. See, because Jesus told us to disciple people in Christ, we never let circumstance change that. And, and, you know, we've got to spend the time it takes to change on our knees in prayer, being Bereans in the scriptures, so that we get their hearts, we get their minds, their very character, to ensure that not only they will inherit eternal life, but as many people as possible go to heaven with them. And in the scope of winning, the world to Christ? Sadly, if you're not all about the Great Commission, then you've become a dead-end disciple. And, and I want to call upon anyone who's allowed themselves to be in that place today to rise back up, take advantage of the forgiveness that Jesus has, and let that forgiveness well you up in zeal and passion and gratitude and get back to the Great Commission. See, God wants you and I to be disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. That is the plan of God, and that is the plan of the D.C. church. Let's look at the second thing that a church after God's own heart has, a powerful a message. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, a powerful message. Acts 2 verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you 
by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. What a powerful and challenging message. I mean, Peter stands up here in front of thousands of people, and he says, you're responsible for crucifying Jesus. I mean, how could he tell them they're responsible for the death of Jesus? Well, well hold your place right there. I'm going to read you two short scriptures. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. So your sin and mine has nailed Jesus to the cross, and the wage, see a wage is something we earn, what we earn through that sin is a death sentence. It's what you and I deserve. And quite frankly, we should live our lives in a way, knowing what we deserve that we're not going to get, but knowing what we deserve. So if anybody does anything to me that's not the death sentence Jesus got, the exact death where I got abandoned and, and accused and, and everybody left me and beaten all night and hung on a cross and a spear through my side, but then go to hell for it. If I didn't get that, I should be just fine with whatever somebody's done to me. You see what I'm saying right there? Because I have the armor of God, so it doesn't need to impact me. Because I have the most powerful thing in existence living inside of me, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's a pretty good deal. We become disciples, and then we practically allow Jesus to be Lord of our life. <clears throat> what does that mean? He's Lord of your mouth. He's Lord of your actions. He's Lord of your attitude. He's Lord of your emotions, your money, everything. See, we practically allow Jesus to be Lord of our life by obeying his commands, and he gives us the gifts of salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Wow, the most powerful thing in existence. Consider it. Let there be light. When that was said through the Spirit, the Spirit created what? Light. Can you create light? You can buy a light bulb, but can you create it? Can you manifest it? See, the Spirit can. With the Spirit, you can do anything, be anything, make anything happen. Also, you can stop anything from impacting your heart, from taking you off your mission, from veering you off your purpose. See, the, the Holy Spirit is so powerful that Satan spends all of his time trying to convince you and me not to use that power because that power easily defeats him. See, never forget how easily you can do or fix anything in your life through that spirit. We gotta learn how to fan into flame that spirit, brothers and sisters, amen. Well, let's go on to Acts. Let's go back to Acts 2, verse 29. Acts 2, verse 29. The Bible says, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God has promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave. Nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. <clears throat> How do you know that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, the reason you know that Jesus was the Messiah is the testimony in his resurrection. See, this is what separates Christianity from all other religions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look in the tomb of Buddha. You'll find bones. You look in the tomb of Muhammad. Yes, you're going to find bones. You even look the father of our faith, Abraham, and if you found his tomb, you will find bones. Yet look in the tomb of Jesus, and it is flat. Empty! I mean, I, I mean how important is this, though? Because let me tell you what. We do not carry a mammy pammy message, guys. The message is clear. You have crucified Jesus. And yet what changes everything? What changes everything is the resurrection of Jesus. 
I mean, I want you to think about Peter for a second. Because just 50 days before this, he was confronted by two servant girls in that same city with thousands of people around, and he just cowered down to them and denied that he even knew Jesus. So what changed? 50 days goes by, and what changed? Well, the 40 days about the kingdom of God was pretty cranking. But what changed is now the resurrection has taken place. <laughs> See, now there's those same people. There's the same servant girls out there, and he's like a lion. What made him believe is that Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that changes everything. You see, it was a reality in his life, finally. And when we have challenges that we can't seem to overcome, it's because the resurrection has stopped being real. The resurrection changed Peter, and it can change your life today. See, disciples, if you've forgotten about the resurrection today, then it's time to have the best quiet time of your life and flat get it back. Go listen to the first principle studies again. Stay the Bible with yourself. Remember who you are. See, Peter and all but one of the apostles, they died a martyr's death because even though they fell away and abandoned Jesus, I want you to check this out. They fell away and abandoned Jesus and went back to their old lives of fishing during his time of need. And... Jesus still turned the kingdom over to them 50 days later. See, because they allowed his resurrection to revive their convictions, and they never lost them ever again. I want to call upon you to make that decision today. Never lose your convictions ever again. I mean, really, how deep is your conviction that Jesus is real, that he's the Messiah, and that he raised from the dead from the most horrific death, death that anyone could ever have, the one that you and I deserve? We gotta get deep convictions today. Let me tell you why it's pretty awesome today. Because both of the Mid Atlantic churches, which is now DC and Atlanta, are baptizing today in the middle of transition. You know, in Atlanta last week, as we drove out, Amy was baptized. And then today, her husband Brian got baptized in the Lord. I'm pretty fired up that he's. A Star Wars fan and a really big one and we're gonna have a, we have a lot in common right there and, and yet you know here's Atlanta in 2021 the church started out with 55 disciples they've had 16 baptisms with only five fallaways and that's with 17 people moving out of the church and, and then in DC today Renelle and Danielle and Noel all went up and baptized Uncle Taylor and that, what a phenomenal thing for someone to come to Christ in their older years. And I'm very proud of Danielle and Renell and Noel. And it's just an incredible thing. And for 2021, the DC church started out with 131 disciples. There's been 15 baptisms. There's 19 fallaways. So we got some work to do. There's been 16 move outs in the church. And now I know Amy and Brian and Uncle Taylor are fired up about their salvation, but are you still fired up about being saved? I mean, are you still fired up that you are saved and have the Holy Spirit in you? I mean, I want to call every disciple in the middle Atlantic churches to be as fired up about their salvation as Jesus wants you to be. Forget about me and everybody else, because if you flat please Jesus, it'll go far beyond any expectation any man can have. And I know we're virtual, but get up and scream. Yell and let the world know about it. You get up and scream for a touchdown. You can get up and scream because you're saved. Fill the chat with the glory of being saved here this morning. There is nothing better in life than to be one with Jesus Christ. Remember, you nailed him to the cross. And it's important to have a deep conviction that you nailed him to the cross. Because if you don't understand the bad news... You can't receive the glory of the good news when he forgives you or when you remember that you are flat forgiven. Now, that's a powerful message that's going to change the world, even here in D.C. It's up to every individual to respond to this incredibly powerful message. A church after God's own heart needs to have a powerful message. Number three, a worldwide vision. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. A worldwide vision. 
Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Check out what, how they hung out. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. <laughs> See, the first century church was a movement that swept the world in a generation. And, and this group that was there is what we call the 120. It's an incredible group of people. And, and you know, it had, you had the faithful 11, and, and then, then Matthias was added to the 12 right there. Then you had all of Jesus' family. You remember how they opposed him early on, even mocking him? Remember when they came to take charge of him because he was out of his mind doing the work of God? And yet because he kept his commitment strong, they were won over in the end through his death. Then you had all the women of the ministry that supported Jesus, and all of them made up the 72. Then you had the 72. So if you take the 72 plus all these people we just described, that makes up the 120. What an amazing group of people they had right there in Jerusalem. See, these are the people who were totally dedicated to the world hearing the message of Jesus. And then Peter preaches this incredible sermon. And what happened? What happened after he preached this amazing sermon on the day of Pentecost? Well, let's look at chapter 2, verse 41. The Bible says, those who accepted his message were, what? Baptized. Well, what if somebody doesn't accept the message of Jesus? Then they're not baptized. You see what I mean right there? And so those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number, that 120, that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were devoted to their prayer life, guys. They were devoted to communion. Never would they take communion and not forgive everyone of everything. Never would they take communion without thinking seriously through their lives and their sins and accepting the forgiveness God gave so they went away fired up and zealous. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and check this out. They had everything in common. And there was races from everywhere all over the world happening that day. I mean, on that day, 3,000 baptized. That meant they had 3,120 disciples on that day. And you know what? There was no distinguishing an apostle from a baby Christian. How about that? There was no distinction between the leaders of the group and those who were just baptized. Everyone was just in awe of God that he was affecting so many lives. Every day, the Bible says they were having baptisms. I mean, they were going to get to the point. We're going to get to the point here in D.C. that we are having daily baptisms. Can I get a big amen? Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We're just going to zip through a few passages right here about the growth of the church. This is what growth is supposed to look like. I've heard there's a few arguments. The church, is it weak? Is it strong? I don't care where it's at. I just know where Jesus heads us. So Acts 4, verse 4 says, But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That'd be pretty cranking if we were to grow to 5,000, right guys? See, men were called higher by this gallant charge to change the world. And the men here in the book of Acts were forceful, dynamic Christians that held the same commitment as the apostles. There was no distinguishing whether somebody's paid, not paid, whether they're apostle or a brand new Christian. We just got to get that down in our thinking. These men were faithful till death. We'll go on over to chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed and were added to the number. Well, they didn't say it because they just hadn't lost count of how many people there were. And then you got chapter 6, verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I mean, this thing was spreading like wildfire. And I guess going from 3,000 for 120 to 5,000 wasn't growing rapidly. So, you know, now we kind of understand forceful advancement, if you will. So 
if they increase to 5,000 and then after that they're like, now it increased rapidly, that should help us understand when the church is doing well and when it's not with God's definition. Amen. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea and Samaria and Galilee enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and grew in numbers. Check this out. Living in the fear of the Lord. If we don't live in the fear of the Lord, then we won't grow in the numbers in the Lord. Amen? It's just described in the church right there. Chapter 11, verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. I mean, this thing was growing so big in Antioch, they go, guys, you got to go see it. So when Barnabas arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them, what? All to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts because that's what it looks like to remain true to the Lord is all our heart. You're not being given all your heart and not remain true to the Lord. See, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now, we know it is talking about over 5,000 and then increasing rapidly, a great number of people brought to the Lord was a massive number of people. That's what forceful advancement looks like. None of us are there. We're all heading there, though. Amen? Verse 16, verse 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith. And check this out, grew daily in numbers. Again, that is where we're going right here in D.C. and the mid-Atlantic churches, amen? Now, but what, right here we see, well, wait a minute, churches. See, it wasn't just Jerusalem growing anymore in verse 16. The churches were all growing in number in the same fashion, amen? Chapter 19, verse 10. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Wow, in two years. And by the way, from a campus ministry, kind of like our George Washington ministry that's being planted, in two years, all of Asia, modern day Turkey, was evangelized for the Lord. Now, what are we going to do right here in D.C. in the next two years? You know, we have what we call Operation Freedom. And in Operation Freedom is the plan to evangelize all of the mid-Atlantic churches. And then we have Operation Persuasion, which is the plan to get to all the major campuses in the major cities of the mid-Atlantic area. I mean, this December, we're sending Mike and Stephanie Schaefer to Dover, Delaware, and they're going to flat plan another church. Right now, they're doing a fantastic job there in Atlanta. Then, 2022, we're going to send the Dorvals to Raleigh, North Carolina. And rally all those people that are down there that we have. And we're going to build an incredible church in 2022. But that's not all. 2025, we're going to Columbia, South Carolina. And then the very next year, 2026, Morgantown, West Virginia. That will be, God willing, the Mid-Atlantic churches. And, and all of the people moving around and all these changes and stuff, it's not supposed to make us focus on our local needs right here. See, it's supposed to give us a vision of a lost world and, and instilling us the fact that we have a worldwide movement with a worldwide dream, which happens to be the dream of Jesus. Amen. You know, it's 60 AD, after a generation, Colossians 1.6, Paul wrote, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace. In all its truth. In verse 23, he moves on and he says, If you continue in your faith, right? Established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard. And that has been proclaimed, check this out, to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. By the time Paul is in prison, at the end of the book of Acts, 30 years, a generation, the church was evangelized. Older Christians, I, I just got to ask you, do you, do you, did you stop believing that we can do it again? Did you stop working like we are doing it again? I mean, right now, we have over 120 churches in around 40 countries on all six population, all six continents that are populated. I mean, the word of God is spreading. It's moving. It's increasing. We're reaching almost 9,000 disciples, just like it says in the word of God. I mean, but if, if everyone imitates me, what kind of church 
is this going to be? Will the word of God be spreading and increasing and forcefully advancing into the nations with a worldwide vision? I mean, I want to influence every one of us today to have a heart after God's own heart. It says, look, listen, I am willing to do anything, go anywhere, and give up everything for the cause of Christ. That is the heart. And disciples get up there like, yeah, let's go. And yet since I've even been here, I've heard from a number of people. I'm just about leading a Bible talk. We're not talking about going into a nation. Well, I don't know if it's the right time for me. Man, it's sad when disciples lose the call of Jesus. We need disciples of Jesus to fit their dreams and their plans into Jesus' plans so we can work the plan and see the world one for Jesus. See, you're either a sold-out disciple or you're not. And what if every member, what if every member of the church was sold out to the point they were willing to die for Jesus? Let me tell you what, you can't say you're willing to die for Jesus if you won't be inconvenienced for Jesus. You know what I'm saying right there? And so we gotta have this church. We need to build a church after God's own heart who maintains their worldwide vision. Well, lastly, number four, great joy. The fourth thing a church after God's own heart has is great joy. Acts chapter eight, verse four. Acts chapter eight, verse four. So there was great joy in that city, the Bible says. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave them their attention. And exclaimed, well, this man is the divine power, knows the great power. Well, they followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. And yet, the hallmark of a church that has God's heart is great joy. I mean, you catch it in the singing. They don't sing too fast. They don't sing too slow either. But they do it with all their heart. You can feel it in the buzz of the fellowship. You can see it in people's faces and in their eyes. I mean, why, why was there such great joy in the first century? Because they constantly saw miracles because they remained committed through all the trials. You see, you see what I mean right there? See, see they, they got to see the evidence of the grace of God because in the hard times, they relied on the grace of God. I mean, have you ever heard someone share their conversion story? They go, wow, that was a boring conversion story. I mean, no one has a boring conversion story. They're all cracking. But God forbid we ever get to the time where we hear everyone's conversion story in our church and haven't heard another one. We have got to be a church that gets toward daily additions. And what's happening here is it, it, it's what's happening here in our movement. I'm sorry, but it just isn't happening anywhere else. It doesn't say there aren't disciples other places, but... What's happening here just isn't happening anywhere else. Oh, there's churches that are all over the world, but operating as one man, as one church, sharing all their resources and people and with one unified plan to win the world, teaching the same thing everywhere in every church. See, what, what can happen when you're in the midst of great things? We can take our eyes off Jesus. We can look at each other and just... Glory in people or look down on people. Can see each other's shortcomings and not appreciate all the miracles around us that God is doing. And I'm so grateful that we're about to watch GNN after this service. And I really hope and pray today that you appreciate how God is moving amongst us in D.C., in Atlanta, in our movement, all over the world. And if you're visiting, I pray that after this service you will set up a Bible study with the person that invited you. I pray that if you've walked away from God's church, uh, even if you're in another discipling church, uh, guys, then who's doing it? you got to look and see who's doing it. Who's following the dream of Jesus? We're all imperfect, so you're always going to find something wrong. But you got to get on board with where it's being done, where you see the grace of God and the additions, and what's happening. And yes, we need maturity. Yes, we need to take care of each other. All those things are true. But we need one unified group of disciples around the world that all want the same thing and are giving their lives.
for to see it happen. So when you go over these scriptures, Bereans, I want you to ask yourself, if everyone in the church imitates me, what kind of church is this going to be? I know after today, it's going to be a much better church. Remember, God's true church has a powerful message, the Great Commission, a worldwide vision, and great joy. Tracy and I are so excited to be working with all of you right here in D.C. Let's build a church after God's own heart. I love you guys. Have an incredible day today. Hello, thank you for tuning in to episode 10 of the Good News Network. My name is Luke Speckman. And I'm Brandon Speckman. And we're reporting to you from New York City. Family, this past month of May had the inspiring theme, Miraculous May. And so it was. From an astounding special missions victory in America to a life-changing missions conference in Eastern Europe. From scores of thrilling baptisms to many glorious restorations, Miraculous May had an abundance of good news about God and his great people in the sold out movement. Yes, and we pray you'll be encouraged as we all get the opportunity to witness a day in the life of Agnel Rosario, a disciple in our Dubai church. In addition, we have an exciting announcement coming to you later from the Sold Out Press International Publishing House. But we start by bringing you news from the vibrant city of Kiev, Ukraine, where disciples gathered in person for the 2021 Eurasian Missions Conference on May 6th through May 9th, titled Shining Like Stars. Geographic missions conferences are vital for disciples in each region of the world to be able to see the kingdom and hear faithful preaching from outside their country. Missions conferences are, of course, encouraging for visiting disciples as well, but even more so for the hosting churches, as often those disciples will not be able to travel to Los Angeles for the Every Other Year Global Leadership Conference, also called the GLC. We currently have 12 missions conferences scheduled for the next 12 months in the following cities. Manila, Los Angeles, Mexico City, New Delhi, Paris, Sydney, Dubai, Chicago, Honolulu, Sao Paulo, San Diego, and Santo Domingo. So while the pandemic has pushed the world into darkness and seclusion, disciples of Ukraine, England, Sweden, Russia, America, the Netherlands, and the United Arab Emirates shine brightly as they came together last month at the Eurasian Missions Conference. Dr. Raul Moreno of Mexico City, Michael Williamson of London, Artie Baker of LA, and Oleg Sorotkin of Kiev delivered excellent speeches. At the women's session, Dr. Elena McKean and Linda Moreno spoke powerfully as they encouraged the sisters to shine even brighter. Other awesome highlights were the Ukrainian cultural dances, the Friday football, or for some, soccer match, where the Kiev team defended their territory versus the world team, the Saturday night kingdom banquet, and of course, Dr. Kip McKean's keynote address at the conference's opening session. Take a look at this clip. In May of 2007, there were just 42 disciples that planted the Los Angeles church. Now God has multiplied them around the world to 9,000 disciples. In 115 churches. In 49 nations, on all six populated continents of the world. This is not a movement of men. It is the very movement of God. Let the river flow. Amen. Thank you, Oleg and Eliana Sorokin, for your hard work and direction to make this conference so memorable. This event serves as a wonderful reminder to all of us how glorious it is when God's people congregate in person to worship together. Jeremiah 23.3 reads, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. What a miracle to see this happening in our day. The ICOC and Mainline Church of Christ Remnant are coming out more and more as they search for a fiery hot church where the Spirit of God is overwhelmingly evident. 
as the truth is being preached and lived out. Dr. Andrew Smelly, the charismatic Africanist world sector leader, reported that this again happened in miraculous May in the nation of Zambia, located at the crossroads of Central, Southern, and East Africa. The Lusaka Zambia remnant group was initiated with the restoration of Patrick Tinta Chona. Of immense influence, Tinta previously led the ICOC Hope Worldwide in Zambia and also is the son of Zambia's former prime minister. Tinta's renewed convictions have now expanded God's sold out movement to an astounding 50 nations. So as of May 31st, the Africanist world sector has six planted churches and 14 remnant groups across Africa. Excitingly, Lord willing this summer, new congregations will be planted in Yaounde, Cameroon and Brazzaville, Congo. So with 116 combined churches and remnant groups in 50 nations around the world and counting, God's movement is moving more than ever. Now in more family news, we'd like to share an update on our brother, South Asia's overseeing evangelist, Raja Rajan. In our last episode, we asked for prayers as Raja and about 30 disciples in India contracted COVID. Miraculously, God answered our cries a hundred times over. After five days, Raja's health severely declining and being turned away from hospitals as all the beds in New Delhi were taken, our leader, Kit McKean, called for a movement-wide day of prayer and fasting for the healing of the COVID-stricken Rajan family and for our brothers and sisters fighting COVID in South Asia and beyond. By the power of God, that very day of prayer, April 26, Raja received a hospital bed and oxygen. He was discharged from the hospital on Sunday, May 2nd, less than one week later. Unheard of. What an incredible display of our awesome God's power through the unity of the believers in prayer. As well, during the month of May, Raja gratefully reported that Lockdown South Asia had 32 additions, 29 baptisms, and three restorations. God is always at work and His Spirit cannot be locked down. With the vaccine beginning to roll out in developing nations, we're excited to see how the kingdom will impact communities with in-person gatherings by seeing our love for one another more keenly than on Zoom. With more of the American population choosing to be vaccinated, plans are being made in all USA churches to move away from Zoom and pre-recorded services to congregations meeting in person for all services. What an exciting change. For those with health conditions that make taking the vaccine risky or conscience issues, or those who simply do not want to receive the vaccine, amen. As 1 Corinthians 10, 23 teaches, everything's permissible. Yet for those who just have not given much thought to making the fellowship and studying with non-Christians safer, we encourage you to do so in prayer as this is a personal decision. Pray and remember that many medical experts are encouraging face-to-face -face interactions without masks for those who have been vaccinated. We have an inspiring update from Mercy Worldwide. Nick and Denise Bordieri, the world sector leaders from Mercy Worldwide, flew from LA over to Nigeria to visit our Lagos church, as well as to oversee the grand opening of the renovated Real Mercy School. Now, the Real School was founded by the school's principal and headmistress, Biodun and Yawande Abudurin. After being met by Lagos disciples, a December 2018 Mercy Worldwide event was organized and held at their school, where food and financial support was given by the Lagos Church to revive their program and support the Okobaba community. Sadly, this area borders arguably the largest overpopulated and impoverished marine housing project in the world called Makoko. The poverty is so challenging in Okobaba that the parents struggle to pay the school's fee of approximately $1 per day for their children's education. After seeing the love and the support of the Lagos disciples, the Abadurans started studying the Bible and were both baptized in early March 2019. At the time, Yawande was very pregnant and soon afterwards she began experiencing a difficult pregnancy, which demanded a C-section. And the hospital that they were going to lost power. All the Lagos disciples prayed for two days, begging God for the safety of the birth and for the power to return. As Biodun and Yawande were heading to the hospital, in answer to the prayers, the power returned, the necessary surgery was performed, and the baby was born safely. Out of gratitude to God and His kingdom, Biodun and Yawande decided to name their daughter Mercy. 
A renovation plan for the school was necessary because of its dangerous location, which was an ongoing distraction for the young students due to the noise, gangs, drugs, and prostitution surrounding the school. Sadly, there were also no toilets available on site, and they had to go into a field to relieve themselves. Through the generous support of the movement, the school was moved to a safer location within Okobaba and remodeled from a wooden structure to a stable brick building and renamed the Real Mercy School. The school has now transformed into a dynamic primary school program, which enrolls 100 children, ages three to 12. The renovation enabled eight classrooms to be built, all equipped with electricity and new whiteboards. A new 60 foot freshwater well was also dug to supply a water tank which allows the school to have fresh water without needing outside sources. Thankfully, four bathrooms were renovated and four more bathrooms were also built. Please pray as plans are being made to feed the students and their parents on the Day of Mercy on June 19th. What amazing news from the Real Mercy School. We are looking forward to our 12th annual Day of Mercy on June 19th, where our churches around the world initiate benevolent projects to meet the needs in their surrounding communities. Lastly, to close out our special announcements, we want to extend a huge congratulations to all of the USA churches for an unbelievable May missions. Collectively, we we're able to raise over $4 million for new plantings, sustaining third world churches, and training missionaries in America. Thank you for your hearts to give to God's family and to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, let's go over to Dubai to see a day in the life of our dynamic brother, Agno. See you. Good morning. Uh, bro, we want to talk about some couple things today. Mm -hmm. um, I take me take me through like a, a typical day um, of Agno, the disciple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So my typical day looks like morning when I wake up. I'll, I, I always like to praise God as soon as I wake up in the morning. So I just roll from my bed and I, I go on my knees on the bed. Okay. I pray to God. I do my prayer. Hmm. Then me and Theo, uh, we go to the park. Uh, we do a prayer job. Mm -hmm. Then I take time to read the scripture. Yeah. So there are different types of people in uh, Dubai. It's hard to get a full house mm -hmm. because you cannot afford to buy a house or rent a house. Mm -hmm. So people share their uh, spaces. Okay. So we have one room. And these rooms are rented to other people. Okay. And this is a kitchen like where we, we share. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you cook? Yeah, I cook. Okay, can, but, but can you cook? I love cooking. Uh, okay, but is the food good? It's awesome. <laughs> you are still alive. Okay, all right, all right. Burj Khalifa, Dubai Mall. The next station is so what is one of the visions of the Dubai National Christian Church? Yeah, you see what? It's all numbers, it's all each metal station. El Abuabu Tugla, doors closing. So our vision is to have a Bible talk in each stops. In That's each? Each station. That's the vision? Yeah. Come on, man. I'm glad you know that vision too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And what's special is Agnel leads one of those Dubai Bible talks. Oh, Where, my, my Bible talk is, is number 32. It's in the modern You know that I work as a system admin. Mm -hmm. If network goes down, I need to go there. Mm -hmm. I need to be there physically. Mm -hmm. There are some work like server went off, this and that. I can do it from my phone, my home. But if there is a physical problem in the office network, I have to be there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I need to work till 8 o'clock night, 9 o'clock at night. Even during churches, they, they give me calls. I have to ignore everything because, yeah, of course I'm working for someone, but church is my priority. I need to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. If I don't 
Bible says, seek first in his kingdom and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. The rest of all will be given to you. Right? <laughs> What are some of the challenges that you see disciples face here in the Middle East? Okay, challenges we face is <clears throat> going out sharing our faith. Mm -hmm. That's one of the hardest things because mostly we go to a food court, mm -hmm. uh, a shopping mall, mm -hmm. a, um, a grocery shop, right? A, in a metro. The thing is, uh, we need to f first find out hey, which religion they are. Mm -hmm. I cannot go and share my faith with a, a Muslim guy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a little hard. There are so many laws here. Mm -hmm. I need to be very careful in that. Uh, we need to be very careful in that. I cannot open. Yeah, I want it. No matter what's happening, like I need to be sharp, be trained up, uh -huh. you know? Mm -hmm. I told you like, right, that um, something I taste, I want everyone to taste. Right, right. So if I can do something like working 14 hours, 12 hours, and I can go and meet people, mm -hmm. how about like being an evangelist? Right. Lead a church. Right. You know, lead a nation. Right. Come on, man. Let's big dreams. Come on, Agnes. Thank you, Agnel, for taking us along with you in your day-to-day -day life. Now, a special announcement from Sold Out Press International, otherwise known as SOPI. Sold Out Press International has two exciting books ready for enjoyment and edification. The first, written by Dr. Tim Kernan of LA, is called Dodeca. Dodeca, which means 12 in Greek, is a study series of 12 lessons designed for leaders to make leaders, as Jesus did it with his apostles. R.D. Baker has said of this book, My dear friend Tim is simply one of the best teachers in bringing Jesus' methods to life. In essence, Tim reminds us that Jesus' plan in the first century to change the world is still God's plan for us to change the world in the 21st century. The second book was written by Dr. Raul Moreno and is titled First Love, Restoring Your Relationship with God. This is the perfect book for anyone who has drifted in their relationship with God. Raul calls us back to our first love by reminding the reader of the immense encouragement of simply being a son or daughter of God. He then shares from the Bible and his life the practicals of returning to your first love. With the introduction of these two publications, Soda Press International now has 11 books available. To get your own copy of Dodeca and First Love, visit AmazonSmile.com. We have our copies right here and we can't wait to read them. Yes. All right, now it is time for good news from around the world. After a riveting report in the April of GNN on the power of teens, it's awesome to report that the Manila Church has reached 100 teen disciples for the Lord. This united front of world changers will undoubtedly do great things for God. One inspiring story is that of Jash meeting Faith. They went to high school together and Jash reached out to Faith through their school's Facebook page. Faith started studying the Bible and is now your sister. It's incredible that during a pandemic, God brought light to pierce the darkness associated with the internet and has taught us how to use social media to contact and save souls. Now in the Chicago church, 131 in number 17 months ago, now has over 300 members. Not only has Chicago been advancing in number, but also in power. Many five talent disciples, including an all league baseball player, a television actor, and many dynamic college students in universities across Chicagoland have become our brothers brothers and sisters. Chicago is also the pillar church for the PAC world sector, which covers the Midwest and Pacific Northwest states in America and all of Canada. This summer, the PAC will have three church plantings, Detroit, Michigan, Boise, Idaho, and St. Louis, Missouri. Over in Amsterdam, Netherlands, Ruben is a medical student and worked for the Salvation Army. Though a believer in Jesus, studying the Bible, Reuben realized that he was never made into a disciple of Jesus. After two months of dismantling religious theory and building convictions on God's word, he saw the truth and became a baptized disciple. Reuben, we're so happy to have you healing as a doctor alongside the great physician in the true Salvation Army. 
On May 29th, Hong Kong hosted an in-person Women's Day titled Beloved. After one and a half years into the pandemic in China, 48 amazing women were able to gather, 15 disciples and 33 visitors. Remember, there were only four women on the Hong Kong mission team and one had to leave for visa issues early on. However, from the three original mission team members to many of our new converts, the sisters shared how God's love amplifies how they love. Women of different ages, backgrounds, and nationalities were moved, and the Hong Kong Church, also known as Crouching Tiger Number no. 1, is looking forward to these powerful women becoming our sisters. Oh, yes, in China, Crouching Tiger 2 now numbers 10 disciples as they had another baptism. On May 23rd, the Lima, Peru Church celebrated their second anniversary. In these past two years, the Lord has multiplied the seven mission team disciples led gallantly by Danilo and Carol Bataglin into 54 vibrant disciples in Lima. This month, Justin was added to this flock of zealots. After intensely persecuting him, Justin's dad was persuaded to come to church to witness his son's baptism. Immediately following Justin's good confession, Jesus is Lord, he pointed to his father and said, although you still don't understand, I pray you too will be baptized soon. What an incredible love to show your dad you care deeply for his soul, my brother. In Dubai, while working at the Metro, our sister Rebecca met Frida about a year ago. Frida started studying the Bible, but was not ready to give up a relationship. After many months, she asked to study again and was ready to leave everything for God. She was moved by the unity of the Dubai church family. Originally from Kenya, Frida shared that Kenyans don't know others deeply outside of their own tribe. Now, since there were four women of different nationalities in her Bible studies, Frida now knows that this is one true tribe and one true family of God. Welcome to the kingdom, sis. Lastly, we'd like to announce the first ever USA Campus Leadership Seminar this upcoming fall. Many churches have found it difficult to baptize college students during the pandemic since most campuses have been completely shut down. Yet, since campus ministry is the heartbeat of the sold out movement, KIPP has called every church leader to have special focus in building their campus ministries. Therefore, over 500 campus leaders have committed to gathering in Miami this September 2nd to the 5th for a weekend of unforgettable, life-changing lessons. The primary reason Miami was selected to host this conference is because of the incredible example of their campus ministry during COVID. Beginning with only 38 disciples as of September 2020, they have tripled their campus ministry to 120 in only eight months, thus setting the pace for all campus ministries in the movement. Great job, Marcel and Tia Turner. We can't wait to see so many of you in September. We are so proud of them. We thank you so much for tuning in to this month's episode of GNN. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to GNN on YouTube and share it with your friends and family. We are family to the end. We are so looking forward to GNN 11, which we will report on Jubilant June. This is Luke and Brandon Speckman reporting to you from the Good News Network. The best news you'll ever see. Thank you for joining our virtual service. If you'd like to do a Bible study, get baptized, get restored to the Lord, or if you just need a prayer, go down to the description, click on the link to contact us, and we'll get back to you immediately. Thank you and have an incredible day.